Welcome everyone. I'd like to call the April 2nd regular City Council meeting to order. Council members Goodman and Ray are excused this evening. I'd like to ask any of the, you in the audience this evening that would like to join the Council myself in the Pledge of Allegiance to please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item under special business this evening is a proclamation, AB 7578, Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And I would like to call King County Sexual Assault Resource Center board member Sandy Dupleach to please join me at the lectern. Whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month calls attention to the fact that sexual violence is widespread and impacts every person in this community, and whereas in Washington State, 45% of women and 22% of men report having experienced sexual violence in their lifetime, and whereas nationally one in five children under the age of 18 are sexually abused, and in King County last year, 2,000 children and youth who have been sexually abused receive services from the King County Sexual Assault Resource Center. And whereas working together to educate our community about sexual violence, supporting survivors when they come forward, speaking out against harmful attitudes and actions, and engaging in best practice sexual violence prevention, sexual violence prevention work helps end sexual violence. Now therefore I, Mary Lou Polly, Mayor of the City of Issaquah, do hereby proclaim April 2018 to be Sexual Assault Awareness Month in the city of Issaquah. And I encourage all citizens to join me in this special observance and join advocates and communities across King County in taking action to prevent sexual violence. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and seal to the city of Issaquah the 2nd of April. And I'd like to give her a chance to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, council members and city residents. Uh, my name is Sandy Duplach, and I am a board member for King County Sexual Assault Resource Center. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, for uh, really giving the importance that um, this proclamation uh, deserves uh, by uh, pr proclaiming April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month um, in the city of Issaquah. Um, as a resident um, of the city for uh, 20, over 20 years, actually, um, and having raised three children here, it is just so important to me to know that as a parent and as a board member of this really uh, important organization that our city stands behind the survivors of sexual assault. So thank you so much for supporting uh, Case Arc and Human Services um, with uh, funding as well. It's, it's so important and we just we can't be more grateful. So thank you. Sandy, thank you. Thank you. Great. I also have uh, some buttons for the council members, if that's okay. Oh, thank you. If you bring this to the city clerk, that would be awesome. Thank you for coming today, Sandy. Next item under special business is AB 7574, Citywide Strategic Plan. We'll be hearing a presentation this evening. This is the first presentation <coughs> to the council. I'd like to invite Sustainability Director David Fujimoto and Consultant Brian Scott of BDS Planning and Urban Design to present an, an overview of the Our Issaquah Project. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm David Fujimoto, Director of the Office of Sustainability. Uh, we're here tonight to talk a little bit about the uh, launch of our work on the citywide strategic plan. Uh, just give you a brief overview and um, share this information with the public uh, since we're now getting underway. Uh, as uh, Mary Lou, uh, the mayor mentioned, I'm also joined by Brian Scott, a principal of BDS Planning and Consulting, who we've uh, brought on board to support us in this effort. 
Uh, real quickly, in terms of the uh, overall purpose and intent of this project, it's been a goal for the city and city council for many years to get this work underway, so we're extremely excited about getting this process underway. Uh, really, we're here to affirm the vision for Issaquah and establish a framework for us to be able to better uh, understand and articulate the community's priorities, and then develop a, a framework and a, a process and tools that'll help us to align our efforts towards those, those processes. Uh, it's something that we know uh, needs to be strategic in nature, and needs to be forward-looking, uh, in the process of doing this work, uh, we have some goals to engage diverse audiences in our community through a variety of engagement efforts, carrying those engagement efforts throughout the process. Um, we know that we want to, um, as we're identifying some of those priorities and articulating goals, that we'll be developing strategies, but also developing performance measures to help identify um, whether or not we're making progress. And then we also know that it's something that, um, in the end, needs to be able to be clearly communicated to our constituents out to our community so that they know uh, what it is that uh, we've identified and how we're making progress. Uh, we see this as something that's a tool that will also align to the city's efforts internally in, in terms of how we think about our staff, um, how we work uh, jointly and cross-departmentally on projects. Uh, it will also align with future budget efforts so we can align our community priorities with our budgeting process, as well as other um, plans and strategies and tools like our capital planning process as well. I'm going to turn it over to Brian uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, BDS and Eco Northwest, who's the, the consulting groups that are working with us, and a little bit more about the process. Good evening. I'm Brian Scott with um, BDS Planning, uh, and I have the pleasure of being the project director on this project, and I've spoken with most of you on the phone uh, in the last week, so nice to uh, connect with you face-to-face. Uh, BDS Planning and Echo Northwest are uh, working together on this project. Um, we often work together and we do a lot of uh, public sector strategic planning, including municipal strategic planning. We recently did a strategic plan for uh, Salem, Oregon. We're currently engaged in one in McMinnville, Oregon. Um, BDS had recently finished facilitating the uh, King County E911 strategic plan, which was a, a regional effort with several folks, including Council Member Martz, uh, participating in, in, in that effort. Um, uh, Echo Northwest is the Northwest's um, oldest and largest uh, economics firm. Uh, one of its founding principals, Terry Moore, is their lead uh, on this project, um, uh, a along with some others. Um, BDS has been, uh, I founded the firm about 10 years ago. Um, I've been doing uh, community development and strategic planning around the Pacific Northwest for uh, over 35 years, had the chance to work in communities all across uh, Oregon and Washington, and so it's a pleasure uh, to be in a community that I haven't worked before uh, and, and add to the, add to the um, uh, portfolio of work. Um, on this particular uh, project, um, there are four key parts, a situational assessment, community engagement, the strategic plan and implementation strategy. Uh, Echo Northwest is the lead on the, facil on the, on the situation assessment. They're underway on that now. Um, Terry Moore, uh, as I mentioned, Mike Gleason, uh, who is a longtime uh, public sector manager. He managed uh, four different cities and three counties, so he's a very seasoned um, professional. He's mostly retired now, but he has a lot of uh, useful advice, um, as well as Eric Rundell, who's done some recent work in Issaquah, so he's familiar with the community, helped hold to give us that anchor. Our community engagement team will be led by our project manager, Gabriel Silberblatt, who's here with me uh, tonight. Um, and we have a team of uh, diverse folks who we handpick to try and fit the different communities in Issaquah that we uh, want to engage. And then all of us will be working together on the strategic planning and implementation uh, parts of the project. Um, the process, um, as I described to some of you individually, but I haven't done it in public, has three big uh, phases. The first one is about who we are now and who do we, who do we want to be, who do we feel about it. The second phase is about where do we want to go. That's really the strategic thinking uh, phase. And then the third phase is about how we're going to get there, implementation planning for that. 
just underway for a few weeks now, but there are lots of parts to the community engagement. I think um, David's gonna mention a few more of those in a moment. Um, we're about to launch a community-wide online survey so everybody can have a chance to uh, express their values about Issaquah and their dreams uh, and hopes. Um, we're engaging a number of focus groups for people to talk about what they hope for um, Issaquah. We're producing a thing we're calling Meeting in a Box, so we have all the materials for folks that wanna add to those meetings and organize their own meetings, uh, as well as some community pop-up events at the same time that Echo Northwest is busy compiling a situation assessment based on the city's existing documents uh, and interviews with um, city department heads to try and sort of characterize that situation, that, the, the existing situation. That'll all come together at a strategic planning charrette later in the spring where we'll meet with the council department heads and key stakeholders in the community to try and refine that into some key strategic priority areas. And then we'll work through the couple of months after that to in individual work groups on each of those priority areas to establish goals and objectives. And then through the summer on specific action plans and performance metrics and a first year work plan. So that's the, the plan for the process. Today is just uh, an introduction to that. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so just a little bit more information in terms of timeline going forward. Uh, we are still working on some specific dates uh, as we think about the engagement effort. Really, um, as part of that first phase of engagement that uh, Brian spoke about, there's a pretty concerted effort and, uh, and a staff-led effort to uh, go out to the community uh, to reach the, the diverse audiences that we have in our community. We want to make sure that we get that part right, and so that's going to take some time. We have a whole variety of different strategies for doing that, um, but that really kind of drives our schedule going forward. Um, it's the key and uh, one of the most important inputs into um, the community uh, strategic planning charrette that will be happening uh, that will be in May or June, uh, as well as the situational ass an, uh, assessment that's coming forward as well. Um, in the process of review, um, as we kind of proceed through each, through each of these steps, uh, we'll be working with a project leadership team um, with some various checkpoints and then also working with city council. So we'll be coming back to city council at three different points in the process uh, before uh, bringing it forward for adoption. And those will show up as council work sessions. So those are in the process of being scheduled. I think there's some tentative dates on the planning calendar, but those will be uh, re-looked at as we proceed with uh, the engagement process. Uh, concurrent with that is also ongoing communications that we will have out about the, the project as a whole. Um, a couple of pieces uh, in kind of real time or it's happening right now. Brian mentioned the vision and value survey. Uh, that is now live. Uh, we just uh, launched that today on the city's website. So our communications team will actually be promoting that through a variety of different channels um, as both electronic as well as just in, on the ground in the different communities. There'll be a resource card that I have here somewhere that will be shared uh, to different audiences. Uh, we're talking about uh, A-frame signs and neighborhoods so we can get the word out, trying to find a whole variety of different avenues in addition to direct outreach to different uh, community uh, voices and leaders uh, to be able to share that information. So vision and value surveys uh, on the streets, there's a, a, a link or a um, URL to the website. If you go there, you can uh, find a link to both the survey as well as you can sign up to alert, a listserv so you can uh, be informed about uh, future events uh, and updates on the website. Um, and then we're also working to schedule the pop-up events, the meetings in a box, and then focus groups later this month and into next month. Great. Thank you, David and Brian and Gabriel. You weren't there, so can you wave at everybody? That's Gabriel, our other uh, team partner there. Um, during special presentations, we usually do not have questions, but if you have a quick question or two, we can probably fit it in tonight. All good? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very Thank exciting you. start. Next on our agenda this evening is audience comments. This is your time to address your council. There are guidelines on this on the bottom of the meeting agenda. Anyone who signed up on our speakers list tonight will be called forward first. And if you did not sign up, I will then ask for other speakers before I close this portion of the meeting. When you're uh, recognized, please come up to the lectern use the mic and speak into the microphone. State your name, address, and relationship to the city. 
Just a wave of hands. How many people do we think we're having speak tonight? Oh, about 10. Okay, so we will limit comments to five minutes tonight. And if you have anything in writing, please come up after and submit it to the city clerk. There is also a public hearing tonight regarding a street vacation of a portion of Northeast Gilman Boulevard. If you'd like to make comments on this topic, you'll have an opportunity to do so later in the meeting. Thank you for taking the time to come in and talk to your council tonight. And has anyone signed up to speak this evening? Yes, Elizabeth Maupin. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Maupin. I live at 100 Big Bear Place Northwest in Issaquah. Um, I've been a resident most of the time since 1982 and have served on the Human Services Commission. Recently, um, there was another mitigated determination of non-significance related to the Providence Heights property. Um, it seems to me that there's been considerable public comment about the significance of that site, both the first time we went through this and the second time, and it doesn't seem to be making any impact. So I'm wondering, I know you can't answer questions now, but I wonder what part that public input really has in that public comment period on the final outcome of determining the significance of destroying properties in this city. That's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Fisher? Susan Haas. Mm. Hey, good evening, staff and city council and mayor. Holly, thank you. Um, my name is Susan Haas, and I live in Sammamish at 19524 Southeast 24th Place. And I'm a Thursday morning volunteer at the Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank. So that's my main connection to Issaquah. Um, <laughs> and also just being uh, one of the many people interested in preservation of Providence Heights campus, a very special but very secluded place. Um, I just want to say something great happened. There was a woman named Martha from the Office of Sustainability that responded to a question that I had about the single family small lot zoning. I was wondering whether social services and nonprofit organizations, whether that permitted use can be in overnight services. And she, um, Keith Niven, graciously asked her and she said, yes, absolutely. It can be for a shelter. It can be for transitional housing. So it was really good news just to that citywide that zoning allows that. I just was so heartened by that. Um, and also, that's the zoning that's at Providence Heights campus right now. Um, and it would be just great to, if that place can be preserved, to work with the city on what the city's vision already is for that, you know, site mm -hmm. through the zoning and all of that. So I'm just really thrilled um, with a lot of the contact with various staff here, Keith Niven and other people. Um, <clears throat> and also I just wanted to say I really applaud that this partnership with the Issaquah School District and working together. I think that is so great. <laughs> that you, uh, this cooperation and coordination that you started this afternoon, or I'm sure it was started before then, but um, it's really wonderful. And I just really encourage that that process that you really empower yourselves and the school board to be, and the staff, the city staff, the school board staff, to be really equitable in that process and very just and very transparent that you know everything you need to know to be able to make your decisions and and I guess one small example is that the testing for the soils on that site near the Swedish hospital and the assessment of the trees, it sounds like it has not been completed potentially because it's expensive to do. Um, but as I understand how people's time is very precious also, that I guess I just encourage <laughs> you to ask the school board to just 
find out what needs to be found out before going through all the questions from city council and all the you know the process and the calendars and all that because i just know how valuable your time is to you and your loved ones and i just want to see it all work out well and in terms of other school sites i just i've heard of various school sites um and the one that they condemned near Klahani, as far as I understand today, I just really think it's important to look at the whole picture and the whole school, school district and what you're doing today, bringing a map and all your information. And um, I think that will really help um, make some really good decisions and then see how can you best to maximize all your goals is the you know the, the city and the special district that the school district is so thanks a lot <laughs> thank you susan mm -hmm. anyone else sign up yes karen lee hello my name is karen lee Elizabeth, Susan, and I, oh, I'm sorry. I moved to Issaquah in 1991, and now it is part of Sammamish. <laughs> so technically, I live in Sammamish now. Um, Susan, Elizabeth, and I are all on the board of Preserve Providence Heights. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we organized in December to help save Providence Heights for um, historical landmark, which Issaquah, city of Issaquah designated last year. And um, we have been trying very hard to find um, another use for Providence Heights so that um, the city of Issaquah could have um, social services and housing for the poor and preserve the buildings that are there now which could be reused and including the fact that it's the only um, bomb shelter on the east side and we may need it someday. <laughs> um, we heard about a couple other sites for high schools that I don't know um, if they're possible but they're both in the highlands which would be a great because most of the students who need us high school are in the Highlands. It would be great for them to have a local high school so they don't, wouldn't have to be bused to Providence Heights, which is pretty far away from them. And one of them is Lakeside Development of five acres. And the other one is Shelter Holdings, which has 21.5 acres. I know that they're getting ready to develop it, but maybe something else could be put there, like a high school. And um, our nonprofit is working very hard to partner with other nonprofits. And we found another nonprofit who is very interested in buying the property to, um, I, she was here at the last council meeting to talk about it, her vision of housing um, women and rehabilitating them to be functional members of society and then their families and then finally later on men and um, we have other nonprofits that are very interested in joining with us so that um, they also have some money but together we could probably come up with enough money to that would satisfy a church home that they would be willing to sell it to us i mean not to us but to her we're just facilitating this. We're not, we're not actually get involved. Um, the other thing is, oh, where was I going? <laughs> um, the, in order for this to happen, we need to have the um, historical landmarking um, stay in place because Christine could really, um, all she, she said it would probably cost about maybe three to five million dollars to remodel the buildings as they are so that they're fully functional to her purposes. And um, we would have to have the school district 
remove the eminent domain, which is why I mentioned the other sites for a possible high school in the Highlands instead of Providence Heights. And so with your help, we could help fulfill this provision and sign for something really wonderful at Providence Heights. Thank you. Karen, before you leave, can I get an address for the Preserve Providence Heights as well? Uh, <laughs> Or your address? My okay. address is 582 240th Avenue, Southeast, Sammamish. And I put it on the form to fill out to speak. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. No one further has signed up to speak. Is there anyone else that would like to speak this evening? Mr. Kapler standing up. Thank you, uh, David Kapler, 255 Southeast Andrews. Uh, traffic calming in Old Town seems to be working including even with uh, garbage bags on the signs. So thank you, we'll see if that keeps working. Um, given the lights issue at the middle school, I think it was just demonstrated that um, the, Bell, the Issaquah School District is not capable of doing their own SEPA, and SEPA for a school site in the Highlands needs to be done by the city. Um, we also need a park on the western part of the Highlands and we got a, a limited amount of property where that park could be. But that is a, a priority for the city and for the citizens up there. The uh, site across the east of the school, of the uh, city's property up there is now a parking lot, but that's not the long-term use for that area. I don't know how tall that building is gonna be, but I think the school building could be brought to the, the east as much as possible because uh, it's gonna be completely visible from whether it's 100 feet in or 10 feet in, it's gonna be completely visible from looking west from the highlands. Um, the green strip that they show on their city, on their county, on the school district website on the eastern boundary of that site where those homes is not gonna work. Gonna, those trees are all in trouble. That land has been so worked over there, drainage has been changed over time, and all the rest, the impacts, this, that little strip of, of green is gonna have to be um, re redone, restarted from scratch. And um, there's forest health issues on the more western part and the slope. Um, we've been dealing with laminated root rot up at Tradition Plateau for years. There's now 20 and 30 foot cedar trees in the middle where that started. And that's how that happens when the county is likes the idea of a state forest. So they got county forests now. They're doing uh, two big um, uh, clear cuts. They're practically clear cuts down by Black Diamond because of the laminated root rot is so bad down there. And they're going back and planting with cedar and pine. And it, the state park had that problem in the parking lot off May Valley Road. It's pine trees now and cedar are what the replacements. Thank you. Thank you, David. My name is Mary Lynch and I reside at 2690 Northwest Oak Crest Drive, Issaquah, Washington. I do wanna say I was glad that there was a meeting with the school district. I would hope that the school district would do a couple more steps in getting all the cities and county representatives together in one big meeting and down and start discussing the overall school district and the impacts because I don't, I see their parcel mealing it out uh, one of the things that's very obvious if you look at the SEPA, as Dave said, that they did for the Issaquah Middle, nothing was really said about traffic and the amount of busing and parrot traffic that's coming into the city due to Issaquah Middle. But I don't know if you're aware of, but there are buses coming over uh, Lakemont and S900 from Newcastle to Issaquah Mi Middle. The new proposed elementary or uh, middle school that they have behind Issaquah Valley probably also will be busing from those areas because to my knowledge, they have not located any property yet down in the Newcastle or in the May Valley area to handle the growth down there. So that means all the traffic, buses and parent traffics are all gonna be coming into Issaquah. And that is not part of the SEPA. I went back and pulled the SEPA for the middle school because I did notice the lights going up and I started questioning that. And lo and behold, on March 23rd, after the lights were already installed over there at this quad middle, uh, we find out that there isn't a permit. It wasn't done. 
They said they had a community process, but if you go back and look at the Development Commission meetings, you look at the SEPA, it's not stated in there that there would be nighttime lighting there. Nor was it said in the traffic analysis that there would be any nighttime lighting nor in the sound control. When you have nighttime games, you've got a lot of noise generating from there. Nothing is said about noise generating. And when you have, um, they're talking the community wants these lighted courses, then that means these are probably nonprofits, soccer teams, other community associations that are using those, while the Issaquah Middle can be having their own programs at the school. So that means more traffic at nighttime, more parking congestion. Nothing is said about the student parking along Evans in the traffic. Nothing is said, it said parents shall always use the main entrance to Issaquah Valley. Nothing is said as the SEPA, the fact that a lot of parents are using Evans to go up into the back side of the, the um, uh, middle school in conflict with the buses that are there and the little buses picking up and dropping and picking up their kids or trying to shoot through the buses to get out the back way because the uh, light is all backed up um, with the buses trying to get out with all the parents from both schools. So that was not any analysis done in the traffic plan. So as Dave said, the city has to be sending back the SEPA if the school district is gonna do it and make sure it is complete and it addresses noise, sound, um, emergency access, uh, screening of any lights or noise that are happening, and also nighttime use. This is a precedent that we're setting here, or the Issaquah School District, for lighting the, the fields. This hasn't been done before, and it's had no real community input. And they're in Issaquah, and I've not seen any meetings where they've talked about it uh, at their meetings, if the board meetings, nor have I seen anything when it was talked at the development meeting. So I got the announcement that next, this week will be the first public hearing where they're gonna talk about the lighting. And where is the SEPA? The city's basically said there is no impact. But there were also, if you remember, a lot of trees were cut down that weren't supposed to be cut down along 2nd Street when they put the new entrance to the bus barn and when they tore down Clark. So all those big trees that could have been screening for the neighborhoods for both noise and lights are gone. And I don't see yet that they're planting any number of trees that are gonna go up, well, I mean, they're small. So maybe in 30 years, we might have some interspersed trees that would block those noise and sound, but it's gonna be 30 to 50 years before you have any of that type of screening. And I think the city needs to insist that the school district does a better job with their SEPAs and we don't approve things without approved SEPAs. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Is there anyone else that would like to speak this evening? Ms. Marsh? I'm Connie Marsh and I live up on Squawk. So I had to laugh in following up on Mary when I read the response about the lights because it turns out what happened is the, the school district put the lights in the SEPA checklist which basically no one in the community reads the SEPA checklist because it's buried way in the back and it's very detailed. And then if it's in the SEPA checklist and it does not come forward as a conversation within SEPA, it is de facto non-studied, right? Even if it's in the checklist. So I would say that was erroneous and there's no way you should be putting lights up or allowing lights up with that sort of situation. So that brings me to my topic, which is I've been watching and reading the Development Commission and the Urban Village Development Commission packages because it's sort of exciting. We have the first time that we're gonna have the architectural review and urban design standards being used, except I can't find them. <laughs> So I had to email for them. Uh, it turns out they're in a different section. They aren't where all the documents are because they aren't complete yet. And so I asked if they were, had been provided to the Development Commission. And they said, no, because they're draft. And I'm going, well, this is the big tool. This is the exciting tool we're supposed to be using to finally get what, we're, what we expect. So, bah. And then Urban Village Development Commission. So I said, 
Wow, what is this? We are supposedly getting a new trail along the outside edge of the Issaquah Highlands, you know, where you peek over the hill and lakesides on the right, but it's city right of way. And so how are we getting a trail that's public on city right of way through basically a preliminary plat that is basically going to be decided by the Issaquah Highlands Architectural Review Committee and staff. So we have a public thing going on public land without a public process. And so you can see, Corey's been, you know, getting the, the sharp side of me because I've been frustrated this week. I did like the meeting that you just had with the school district and I feel that that is the first solid progress that I have ever seen made with the school district in my time of doing this, which is about 20 years. So it's not all the downside, but there's so much work to do in trying to figure out how we get all of our new rules to create the city that we want to have and that the community expects. So one last quick topic on the strategic plan. Well, we've been creating the building blocks for the strategic plan before the strategic plan. So one thing I didn't really understand from what they were presenting is how they were going to go and identify the chunks that we have by force had to create the bricks, so to speak, in building a strategic plan already. Because we aren't gonna have a strategic plan and then go back and redo all of the work. And I don't see how they're getting there just with interviewing department heads. Um, so that is the missing piece I see in the strategic plan. Thanks. Thank you, Connie. Would anyone else like to speak this evening? I see Steve heading over. Hi, Steve Pereira, Old Town, about 10 years. Um, so, so many topics. Uh, the first, I like having the five minutes, but I just want to say again, thank you to all of you for service. I know that taking the extra minutes adds on to the total time that you spend here and other types of folks send, spend here, so thanks for that, uh, public service. Uh, first topic, the, uh, the wraps around the, the utility devices that are art work. Uh, I'm not going to be an art critic. I know I like the one on Front and Sunset and the one uh, East Lake Sammamish and Southeast Issaquah Road by the Walgreens. There are building of, of the environment is kind of featured. Other ones kind of be more modern artwork. I'm not trying to be a critic, but I just think that since Issaquah likes uh, natural environments so much, there's a chance to reflect what Issaquah wants and there's a chance to use the more scenic artwork to reflect who we are, not just as an art critic, but who we are, I think, going forward. Uh, next topic, uh, people have already talked about the uh, combined city council and school board meeting. Echo all of those comments, particularly the uh, Preserve Providence Heights topic. Uh, so much has been said, I don't want to re reiterate the issues. The one thing that occurs to me, though, uh, going forward though, is that as we look forward at lifting the moratorium and there's really no limits to where the, or the number of apartment complexes that can be. I've gone to city to school board meetings and they said the city just keeps approving development and there's no way to reflect that or limit that. I think we're opening ourselves up to have a much wider student body. I'm not saying that number of student body. I'm not saying that because people who live in apartments are less or deserve anything less or better, but we're not prepared for the infrastructure. We're not prepared for the number of students. These are the things we treasure about Issaquah, and I think we need to look at the moratorium and building of not just limiting the number of uh, storage units or the number of hotels, but also look at where and the number of apartment complexes because we've seen where more and more people are at a higher density or living in apartment complexes with students where that wouldn't used to be true. That's impacting the schools. Uh, we need to feed that into account. Uh, Next topic, the uh, citywide strategic plan. I'm glad to see that. I know my own feedback or perspective was when this idea of the regional growth center was kind of first brought forward, I kind of thought, okay, I'm not really sure, but as long as you leave Old Town alone, I'm okay with that. But the more and more I've gone to development city meetings, when I 
see or hear people express concerns, what they say isn't in the terms of development code or city code, but it's in the term of I like the environment, I like seeing my rabbits and squirrels and all those things, the natural environment. Uh, so I don't think people are really understanding what a regional growth center means to them, and so I think we need to take a pause maybe and understand that better, if that's who we are and what we want to be. <coughs> um, Oh, uh, in a recent, next topic, in a recent uh, meeting they talked about it, developing a two-year budget plan, which is fine. I expect the city is gonna spend a certain amount of money on uh, finances and uh, technology and insurance, all that, but try to speak about it in terms of this is what the people, the citizens of Issaquah get. I didn't hear that in the discussion, why that's a good thing. I get maybe it helps city council and, and planning, but I didn't get how it helps citizens. Citizens think in terms of not reading the budget reports, but this is, if I spend an extra $200,000 on this, I have $200,000 $200, less on that. So just kind of keep that as part of the perspective. Uh, Next topic, and I'll just re-echo what the folks said about uh, the school board being responsible for uh, SEPA. That seems, I don't know, the, rabbit, you know, the fox guard in the head house seems a little not consistent track record, so thank you. Thank you, Steve. Is there anyone else who would like to speak this evening? I'm sorry, one other thing real quick. Uh, okay. Sure, uh, it had to do with parks in the San Luis Obispo uh, jurisdiction had set aside and, and has guidelines as far as just preserving natural space, not necessarily for parks or design uses. I think the city parks need to look at that concept, not as parks, but just for preserving open space uh, for the natural environment. And I don't think city code allows for that and needs to, and I'll talk more about that in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak this evening? Second call? Last call for anyone who would like to speak during <coughs> public comments. Hearing none, I'll close the public <coughs> comments portion and like to thank you all for coming tonight, uh, especially those who attended our earlier Isqua School District City of Isqua joint meeting. It's good to hear your comments about school siting, the Highlands, SEPA. Um, also, like to thank people for talking about the Providence Heights campus this evening, um, our new introduction to a strategic plan, and hearing your thoughts on our development review process. We appreciate it when you come and talk to your council. We're moving on to committee and regional reports, and first up is Council Member Hunt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On March 28th, I attended the Cascade Water Alliance board meeting uh, with Mayor Polly, and details will be covered in Mayor Polly's report this evening, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Councilmember Ramos. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Council Infrastructure Committee uh, has one item. It's on a public hearing on tonight's agenda later on. Uh, the other thing is just a reminder that our next meeting is not at the regular scheduled time. It is on Wednesday, the 11th of April, 6.30 here in the normal place, regular place. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Regional Transit Committee met on the 18th of March. There were two items there of interest. One was the community connectors, which includes our new possible route on Talis and Squawk as it's moving forward, and other communities are trying to do similar things, so we're moving ahead on those. And the other one was a uh, thing mentioned, some of you heard before, I mentioned one center city. Uh, a lot of debate on that. That is when the, uh, the bus tunnel in downtown Seattle closes, and they call it maximum constraint because buses can't turn around, they're out of the tunnel because of redesign of the convention center, um, which is gonna be a big change to bus routes, particularly ones going over 520 for sure, but ours as well. And um, the committee was very concerned with most of the uh, proposed changes to deal with the change of that would be affecting the east side bus riders <laughs> with the most effect and not others. So we're pushing very hard back to say getting buses off the street of Seattle, the ones coming from the east side is not the solution, which is the way they tend to be geared towards looking at that as a solution. Instead, we want to keep our buses running in all the way into Seattle as, so we get a our rides in. So I will continue working on that and keep you apprised as that's going. The good news is that start of that has continued to be pushed back. Um, so we keep pushing that back as far as we can. Um, next item is I uh, will be attending an emergency management advisory committee meeting on the 11th coming up here, also agenda to be set. And then on the 13th Friday of April, I will be down in Olympia at the public works board meeting. Uh, also agenda to be set and that concludes my report. 
Thank you, Councilmember Ramos. Councilmember Winterstein. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. The uh, Lodging Tax Advisory Commission I met last Friday on March 30th, uh, two items on the agenda. We did discuss the questions that came out of the Services and Safety Committee meeting, and uh, uh, I'm uh, working, uh, staff is going to be uh, preparing and, and presenting um, replies to that at the uh, Services and Safety Committee meeting next Tuesday. Uh, we also entertained a kind of a, a first look at a proposal, the, uh, the um, AVP, volleyball tournament at the park in June. Um, that organizing group uh, had asked a local events uh, coordinator to make a proposal for, uh, to run some um, parallel community events to coincide with the AVP tournament uh, on, on uh, all of them to take place actually inside the city park, all community related, uh, all Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, including um, um, like a, uh, a volleyball camp for kids, a movie night, uh, a yoga on the beach on Sunday morning or something like that. And uh, I think that was a, it's a good, so they're actually gonna come forward with a proposal uh, because they're gonna make some requests for funding. The only reason I bring that up is it's, it's, it is a good example of how neither uh, LTAC or I think our city staff right now um, has really the ability to kind of field and work with a proposal like this that comes forward, and it'd be one of those kind of things that a, a DMO can handle uh, very well. I just mentioned that example. Uh, so that concludes uh, LTAC. Uh, the next meeting of the Growth Management Policy Board is this Thursday, April 5th at PSRC headquarters in Seattle. On the agenda primarily is the Vision 2050 scoping. I did also want to note that um, last month, the PSRC Executive Board did approve the Regional Center's framework update. Uh, and lastly, I wanna mention uh, something about ARCH. Um, it's not a committee but uh, that I'm part of, but I did attend uh, a meeting that they held last Thursday, March 29th uh, in Kirkland. I joined um, Council Member uh, Hunt and Interim City Administrator uh, Emily Moon joined me at their presentation. About half the time was spent uncovering general housing issues facing East King County and the role of ARCH plays in addressing that need. The other half of the time of the meeting, uh, there were four presentations about different, about what um, different East Side cities are doing in certain areas of housing affordability. Uh, a ARCH staff member actually presented our City of Issaquah's program on auxiliary dwelling units, and I found that informative, uh, and I learned something even though I guess I've heard it before. So hearing it again was very, very helpful. Uh, Kirkland told a story about how they worked with a private landowner uh, that had underutilized land uh, for the development of the first permanent women and family shelter here on the east side. So that was a, it was interesting to hear a use case story of one of our east side cities, coalition members in ARCH, talk about uh, their focus on doing something housing related with private landowners that were had unutilized, underutilized land. I thought that was a good story to hear. Redmond spoke about their success with inclusionary zoning uh, in their downtown area uh, and how they were able to get housing at 80% of AMI and how they're now uh, combined inclusionary zoning with MFTE geography based, not project based, in another area of town and they're, and they're starting to have conversations with builders uh, in that area that they see getting housing at 60% of AMI. So again, kind of a nice interesting uh, thing to hear from one of our colleagues here on the east side. And lastly, we heard from Bellevue about their work in preserving existing affordable housing. housing. Uh, it is a priority for their council. Um, uh, they are being proactive in identifying uh, properties that may be lost. And they even told uh, one uh, example where the school district learned about the potential loss of housing from their students and the school district <coughs> notified the city. Uh, they also are finding that their funding, and no surprise here, for the preservation of affordable housing goes further than their funding for new development. Um, and uh, lastly, they mentioned a thing of interest that they mentioned is that their approach um, does, if they acquire uh, housing for preservation affordable, um, it, their program does include that, uh, transferring the ownership of those properties uh, to a nonprofit housing management agency. So, and that's why I attended that meeting. I wanted to share with all of you, we can never hear a much, uh, can never hear too much about what um, is happening around us related to affordable housing. I just want to share that with you. That concludes my report. Thanks. Also, 
Deputy President Batiste. Thank you, Madam Mayor. No report this evening. Thank you, Council President Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the Council Land and Shore Committee <clears throat> will not be meeting this Thursday, April 5th. Uh, it's in fact going to meet Thursday, April 19th uh, on a special date. And you may be asking why I am giving this information and it's because uh, Council Member Goodman is not going to be able to be there on Thursday, April 19th. So I am going to be chairing Land and Shore and Council Member Hunt is going to be uh, sitting in for Council Member Goodman. Uh, and of, course, and of course, Council Member Winterstein will also be there as, as normal. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Sound Cities Association PIC is meeting on Wednesday, April 11th. The pre-PIC at 6 p.m. at Renton City Hall is going to be uh, the second of two presentations on uh, King County Executive Constantine's One Table organization and its strategies to address root causes of homelessness. And then at the uh, main PIC meeting, there is going to be a conversation that I'm sure Issaquah can have some contribution on school siting best practices and how municipalities can work with their school district, uh, as well as an update on the veteran seniors and human services levy uh, that went into effect at the beginning of this year. This concludes my report. Thank you, Council President Martz. For the mayor's report this evening, there was a special linkage meeting this evening from 5.30 to 6.45 p.m. with our Issaquah School District Board, the City of Issaquah Council and Mayor, and our respective leadership staff. We discussed impact fees collected from developers to pay for impacts from growth to the school system, municipal services, and local infrastructure. The second item discussed was future school siting and the district's desire to purchase city-owned property. Um, it was a good first step, which is what we've already heard, um, but also I just wanted to talk about how difficult it is when we're talking about school siting and other competing community <coughs> priorities. We need to be striving to work together to re reinforce the work that we do with each other and not have these um, priorities competing against each other. And so this meeting tonight was a good first step in the right direction. I attended several meetings in the last couple of weeks, March 28th, the um, Cascade Water Alliance Board meeting with Council Member Hunt. Items presented in the Chief Executive Officer's report were mostly related to the management of the Lake Taps Reservoir and upcoming barrier dam and fish passage construction projects. We are working with uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers on those. And the next board meeting is on April 25th at 3.30 p.m. in Cascade's Bellevue office. The agenda has not been set. March 26th, I attended an orientation meeting with Rima Griffith from the Washington State Transportation Commission's, oh, she is the Washington State Transportation Commission's Executive Director. I'm going to be serving on the Road Usage Charge Steering Committee. The seat was for, formerly held by Samayor, <coughs> Sammamish City Mayor Don Gerrand, by former Sammamish City Mayor Don Gerrand. I did a couple of community and staff outreach events on March 20th. I attended a senior center lunch and conducted a Q&A over several projects going on in town. On March 22nd, I attended the Mountains of Sound Greenway Trust annual breakfast. A couple of announcements. Public Works Engineering had two bid openings occur on the afternoon of Tuesday, March 27th. It, the 2018 water main replacement program, um, this is a, a significant amount of work being done in the South Cove and Timberlake Lane neighborhoods this summer. The work will start in May and June and be completed by August, September. There's a neighborhood outreach plan for engagement um, to the impacted community. Also, the Forest Rim Booster Pump Station was also awarded, and this work involves installing a new booster pump station, demolishing an existing booster pump station on Mountainside Drive Northwest. Most of the work will be done on the existing site, although some of the new piping connecting to the new booster station will be installed in the right of way. <laughs> this will have traffic control implica implications and will allow for a minimum of only one lane to access the Forest Rim neighborhood at that time. The work will start in June and be completed by the end of the year. Neighborhood outreach is also planned for this project. A couple of updates on issues. The moratorium, there are still two remaining work items under the moratorium. Um, inclusionary zoning requirements. Staff is working with Eco Northwest to evaluate the impact the proposed inclusionary zoning requirements would, would have had on the Atlas project. This is being used as a case study. It should be coming to the Land and Shore Committee in April. The district or community visions document for Central Isqua is currently in the City Land and Shore Committee and will be discussed at the committee's April meeting. There's no new information in regards to the Cougar Mountain Bergsma update. 
At the March 5th City Council meeting, I did share with you that we are partnering with the Trust for Public Lands in exploring acquisition options for this property. In that work, park staff and the Trust for Public Lands are collaborating on research and grant options and other funding strategies that would be needed to support any size or scale of acquisition. Also, just an update, uh, if you are not paying attention to our last council meeting, the Highlands Development Agreement did end, the council acted on March 19th and put in place replacement regulations. Also at the March 19th council meeting, the council referred the ending of the Talos Development Agreement and imposing new replacement regulations to the Planning Policy Commission for review of the proposed zoning designation for Talos Parcel 9. That completes the mayor's report. Next item on our agenda is the consent calendar. Council had a discussion at the March 19th meeting about the reading of the consent calendar by the clerk um, going forward in our council meetings this year. The council uh, consent calendar has been distributed to council in advance and it has been past practice at the mayor's preference to read it into um, the record. Um, if, the count, if the council authorizes, um, sorry, if authorized, the council will act by single motion on it. Um, I'm proposing that we, we do not read it into the record unless there is a request to do so. So for this evening, we'll just be moving and seconding, if, if that works. Um, does any council member desire to remove any item from the consent calendar and consider it under regular business? Anyone would like to make a motion? Madam Mayor, I move to adopt the consent agenda as, as listed in this evening, uh, the consent calendar as listed in this evening's agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? It passes unanimously. <clears throat> Next item is our public hearing. AB 7485, vacation of a portion of Northeast Gilman Boulevard. This public hearing is continued from the March 19th council meeting. It was heard as an informational item in the council infrastructure committee. Before resuming the public hearing, I'd like to invite Public Works Engineering Director Sheldon Lynn to briefly present this item. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council, citizens. I'm Sheldon Lynn, the Director of Public Works Engineering. Uh, I'm gonna give a short presentation tonight as a follow-up to the previous presentation that the Council uh, received at the March 19 uh, initiation of this public hearing. Tonight, I'm gonna speak briefly, this, this is a hearing continuance. I'm gonna recap some of the comments as well as the recommendation, as well as I'm gonna recap a little bit about the area to be vacated or proposed to be vacated, I should say. The area proposed to be vacated is shown in the yellow slash greenish yellow color on the map. Uh, it is a section that is located just as an extension of Northeast Gilman Boulevard just east of Third Avenue Northeast. Uh, currently, the right-of-way provides for utilities and access to property that's shaded in the blue, and that property is all owned by one person. In tonight's continuance, the council has asked the policy question, does the city council wish to vacate a portion of Northeast Gilman Boulevard, specifically that portion that was shown in the previous slide? In the testimony, and comments that the city has received. Testimony was heard on the 19th by Mr. Sam Kyle. His testimony essentially identified that the origin of this right of way was originally it was owned by the state of Washington and then as part of the I-90 uh, improvements and at the end of that, the state did, deeded over the right of way to the city of Issaquah. Uh, it was specifically held as right away to provide access to the multiple parcels that uh, are shaded in blue on this map. Uh, these parcels are currently all owned by one person uh, or entity uh, controlled by Mr. Kyle. Comments that were heard at the Council Infrastructure Committee were twofold. One was a desire to keep the right of way for public use uh, and then that was uh, identified as when the PPC was talking about uses at the eastern end of Northeast Gilman Boulevard, 
there was public conversation about the land, but that conversation occurred and was related to the property that was west of Third Avenue, and it didn't really go into the area that was the section that, which is a little tail off the end of Gilman Boulevard. The other was a concern for how this area may or may not be used for a trail connection, uh, dealing with Mountains of Sound Greenway and the possibility of a connection to the High Point Way area. Uh, as you can see, this right of way dead ends into the property of Mr. Kyle, and his property abuts and it has a common property line with the I-90 limited access right of way. Uh, to be able to accomplish the uh, any type of trail connection, it would involve property acquisition, as well as going through substantially environmentally sensitive areas to the east of Mr. Kyle's property to gain access to the trails around the Sunset Interchange. To help un further understand a little bit about what this property is, I've got some Google Street Views that will provide a visual for what the right-of-way is that the council is being asked the question about. This is a street view taken from the intersection of Third Avenue, where Third Avenue meets Northeast Gilman, looking to the east. As you can see, it's a narrow access road, pretty much the width of a driveway, uh, bounded by the overpass at the Sunset Interchange and then the private property on the right-hand side of the road. This is just another view moving further along. Essentially, the character of the right-of-way remains the same. And then at the end of the right-of-way, this shows the larger parcel back in the back. Uh, that is the, basically the dead end of the, the right-of-way. This picture is taken right about property line uh, where the right-of-way ends. And with that, if there's, whoop, one last thing. <laughs> the administration's <laughs> recommendation uh, for a motion tonight is to adopt the ordinance number, whichever uh, comes up, vacating a portion of the street right-of-way adjacent to the property located at 300 and 371 Northeast Gilman Boulevard, subject to easements and establishing compensation to be paid for such vacation. Thank and with Sheldon. that, if there's any questions? Does council have any questions for Sheldon? Not seeing any. Thank you, Sheldon. Guidelines for citizens' comments that are on the agenda also apply for those made under this public hearing. I now open the public hearing at 8.03 p.m. Has anyone signed up to speak this evening? No. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to speak this evening? Steve? Dave, then Steve. <laughs> Okay, uh, David Kapler. Um, I, I would hope that the retained easement would be enough that a trail could, if, if uh, someday a trail goes through that corridor, it would be enough to provide a, a trail through this part of the property. Um, when you look at the, um, there is some space there um, between Kyle's property and I-90, and it does get kind of funny as you go east, uh, but the possibility is there for a trail sometime maybe when the Kyle property is redeveloped or something happens in the long term. So I would just hope there's enough easement retained for a trail on this part of the property that's the subject of the um, potential sale. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Steve? Hi, uh, Steve Pereira. So I live on Northeast Dogwood, so I just am approaching from my own personal perspective, and that's more, I know that the PPC recommended that that district be moved out of the central Isquap land. I, and so I'm concerned with removing right away what potential structure could be built there and whether that's in code or in support of what not being in the CIP. I'd like not to see a large scale development put back there in what seems to be more of a residential or at least connected to a residential area. Um, so because of that, I tend to lean against approving this. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Would anyone else like to speak this evening? That, uh, that was a pretty pitchy pitch by the city to, to turn this land over, uh, which disturbs me a little bit. I think it should be even-handed, 
pros and cons, not just one direction. And um, so I guess that, uh, that concerns me sort of going along with my prior public comment. It's like the community now needs to be equal to any particular landowner and what they want to do. And I would like to see that change be made. For me, I watched the city in this mega planning effort and uh, no one really knows what's gonna go on all the parcels. No one knows what big changes are gonna happen. We're gonna have a strategic plan. Our park strategic plan is only, it hasn't been approved, yet we're looking at potentially giving up a piece of land before we have a plan. And I just think that's unwise. It might take six months and we might say, you know what, it looks from all of our planning efforts like we will never give up this piece of land. Um, for me, that's one of those connections that I can see going back into that area. It's sort of a cool area. You can have movies up against I-90. You could have an auditorium there as a part of a, a large parks plan. That could be our festival street, for goodness sake, because no cars use it. And we could turn that area of town into a community amenity rather than some development. Now, how much would that cost? Would we ever do it? But I don't think you wanna give up opportunities before you've had your planning effort. So I would say no tonight with the caveat when we get our, all of our planning put in place by what, the middle of next year, or whatever, then come on back and we might say yes. Thanks. Thanks, Connie. Would anyone else like to speak this evening? Mary? My name is Mary Lynch and I reside at 2690 Northwest Oakcrest Drive. And I just wanna build on what Dave and, and Connie has said, is as part of the um, central area plan, we had looked at this area as being a destination place where we could have um, old car venues, have um, you know parking for takeoff to the to the other trails within Tiger Mountain and that sort of thing. And I don't haven't really seen the park plan yet or the Emerald Necklace, the full connections to know how we're going to connect out of that area into the other areas. So without that plan in place to vacate land and not have the the full plan, I think it's just premature. And I think we need more um, public input explaining where this is and what the impact is. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Would anyone else, anyone else like to make a comment this evening? Seeing none, I'll ask a second time. Anyone for public comment? Last time, closing the public hearing at 8.07. And it's for council. Here to make a motion. I would move to adopt ordinance number 2832, vacating a portion of street right away adjacent, adjacent to property located at 300 and 371 Northeast Gilman Boulevard, subject to easements and establishing the compensation to be paid for such vacation. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Council <coughs> discussion. Councilmember Hunt. I am um, not in favor of this motion I um, of this ordinance this evening. I think that this part of town is um, potentially very important for the green necklace and as has been mentioned in public comment this evening, the park's uh, strategic plan is still in the works and I think that um, nearby to this property there is potential for a linear um, park in the very wide right of way um, along Gilman and potentially also Kitty Corner, there's some areas that may also be part of the park's plan and um, of that green necklace and of that connectivity. I think that there is potential if, um, if currently undefined potential for public use and I think that um, we can't know what this area looks like in the future, particularly if we uh, vacate this property. I, um, because of the potential for future use, I am in favor of retaining the property and um, I'm opposed to the uh, adoption of the ordinance. Thank you, Councilmember Hunt. Others? 
Councilmember Mar Council President Mertz. I have a, <clears throat> I have a question for the administration, which is um, timeliness on this. If we were to say that this is something that we would like to wait. Uh, for the uh, parks, recreation, open space, trails plan um, before making a decision. What, if any, would be the impact on the, uh, on the owner and their plans of the property that's served by this uh, easement? I can't speak to the impact on the owner. I'm not sure what the owner's plans entail at this moment in time. Uh, but what I can say is uh, there's uh, no urgency from the perspective of the city. This um, has been our property, as Sheldon mentioned, for several years. I think we've been trying to collaborate for at least two years with the property owner on this transfer. Um, but having said that, your parks plan is imminent. I will also say that uh, we've had conversations with the Parks and Recreation Director about um, what may or may not be shown in the draft parks plan, and there's not a foreseen need for this piece of property as an element in the parks plan or integral to making other elements of the parks plan come to fruition. Thank you. Any other council member conversation? Council member Ramos? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I have a similar question to you, is timeliness. Um, in, in the discussion there, um, we never talked about um, a need or rush to do this. It was just something, it just started as a conversation of property owner wanted it, it would take a piece of roadway out of our inventory basically that currently functions as a driveway, right? And, uh, and it just would relieve of some of that. Now, what you did talk about was keeping the uh, right-of-way access for both WashDOT and the city, and that was, uh, if I remember right, just for utilities, correct? So all the underground utilities would, would have the right-of-way for is what we would maintain, nothing on the surface? That's correct. It, the ordinance would retain all the utility easements as well as access for maintenance uh, for the WashDOT wall that's right there that abuts that little roadway. Any other questions or comments? Council, Deputy Council President Batiste. So I would say just in regard, I, I actually had the, a similar question to Tola uh, uh, just in terms of um, timing uh, and where we were at with that, uh, but would I, I believe at this point would be echoing uh, a lot of what uh, Council Member Hunt talked about in terms of um, this having been talked about uh, in the past and if it would be part of the strategic plan or part of the green necklace um, if there's, um, if, if we're not in a rush to do that, uh, then I would consider delaying. Thank you. Any other comment? Council Member Winterstein? Thank you. Regarding, you know, potential park site or anything like that, um, up against a highway, um, it, it, for me, that would be a real stretch of the imagination uh, to be used as a park site. Um, the property owner does have ingress, egress over it now, over that, and that'll probably be retained. There is some open land southeast of there, which is accessible via 3rd Street and Bush Street. If we wanted to get to there, there is other ways to get to the other open land that's, like I said, southeast of there, which is still adjacent to a highway. Um, uh, I, so it's, um, I, I'm going to uh, agree with the administration on this recommendation um, I, because uh, it's really difficult imagine at all there's a parks use for a parcel of land this of this size and shape in this location that's probably going to remain a um, ingress and egress to the property owner for now into the future so I'm going to support this motion any other discussion it's president Martz so uh, I I'm of two minds on this. Uh, I am uh, 
having a hard time envisioning how it gets used as recreational space, but because there isn't an urgency to this and because some of my fellow council members would like to pursue this a little further, uh, I am also going to vote against uh, this bill this evening. Uh, again, um, I, primarily because of some of the questions raised this evening and because there isn't an imminent urgent need for this to be transferred right now. But I did appreciate the administration saying that there isn't currently anything recreationally planned around this space and uh, I hear that, but uh, nonetheless, I'm gonna be voting no. Yeah. Any other discussion this evening? Are you ready for a vote? If there is no further discussion, all those in favor of adopting ordinance number 2832, vacating a portion of street right of way adjacent to property located at 300 and 371 Northeast Gilman Boulevard, subject to easements and establishing the compensation to be paid for such vacations, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Nay. Motion fails. Uh, Winterstein in favor and four others opposed. Um, the next item on the agenda is regular business. There is no regular business this <laughs> evening. That's the good news. Uh, we'll move to good of the order. Do any of the council members have something? Oh, for good of the order. Council President Martz. I do, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, some of you in the audience and in, in the viewing public may notice that I am uh, not wearing my standard solid color uh, polo shirt. Um, I am actually wearing, um, this is Ghanaian, meaning from uh, the nation of Ghana in West Africa. I have, from the 9th through the 26th of, of March, I was doing training in northern Ghana. Uh, for people who don't know, Africa is really huge, right? You could fit all of the United States and China and India and Western Europe uh, in Africa and still have room left over. And so Ghana doesn't show up very large on a map, but it's actually about the size of Minnesota and it has about 25 million people. Uh, about 70% Christian, about 25% Muslim. The two communities get along very, very well. It's a democracy. It's had numerous trans uh, orderly transitions of power as a result of elections and that's becoming more and more common in Africa. Uh, and it was an absolute delight to uh, spend two weeks in Ghana, although it was unmercifully hot. It was about 105 in the northern dry parts. Uh, and the, the populated southern parts, it was only about 85, but it was a 75 degree dew point, which is sticky uh, indeed. And I was undergoing training on how to interview people in for humanitarian technology. So I was uh, learning how to speak primarily with smallholder farmers. These are the folks in Africa who are most at risk of famine and drought when bad things happen in Africa. And, and my day job, uh, I develop technology for those folks. And so uh, I mention all this uh, as a precursor to saying, as I said before I left, how much I appreciate that uh, my fellow council members and the administration uh, supported me in being gone for two weeks. Uh, I don't intend to be gone for two weeks again uh, for a very long time, but it was exceedingly worthwhile and I will be better able to develop technology. And uh, uh, for that, I hope to help the folks in Ghana and other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And for that, I thank you all very much for your assistance. Thank you, Council President Martz. Anything else for good of the order? I have an item if no one else does, or actually, I guess, for the next item, upcoming council meeting. Just checking, nothing else for good of the order? Okay. Upcoming council meetings. Council will be having a work session on April 9th to discuss property acquisition and dis disposition um, practices in the city. This is coming out of our joint Issaquah School District City of Issaquah meeting tonight. We're gonna to be looking at our practice and in particular in relation to a parcel that the school district is interested in buying in the Highlands. On April 16th, the council meeting, uh, council will be getting a 2018 legislative summary. There is an awful lot of items on consent uh, calendar, but the main meeting that night, there'll be a public hearing on the first major amendment to the Costco Development Agreement and uh, re returning 
I believe it's no, it's a re fun, new funding request for temporary staffing. Um, just checking with the interim city administrator. Is that a new or returning request for additional staffing? It's a, it's a, new. It's a new request. And that's what we have to look forward to at our next couple of meetings. Last item, executive session. There is no executive session this evening. So there being no further business, the meeting is adjourned at 8.20. Thanks.